more than we can deal with tonight. Um, uh, Marinella raised the question of don't they realize the destruction, that, that there's no future for humanity if they pursue their course? Um, in the environment, in war, whatever, the, uh, the owners of the New York Times are extremely aware of the dangers of global warming and they write about it all the time. And they know that deforestation is a big contributor, that it, uh, greenhouse gases get absorbed by trees. And they editorialize against global warming and they call for this and that. But are they going to not run one, ad one less advertising supplement, even one less page of advertising to save some trees? <laughs> it doesn't matter what they realize. They have to do what their system forces them to do. And uh, the only thing that can stop them, that stop them is us. You know, is it rational to lay off people in a time of economic crisis and then they can't buy anything and it'll get worse? To cut government services when uh, the economy is collapsing. But they're doing that. And uh, they built, you know, uh, Cameron Adam raised the nuclear bomb they, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm glad he raised that. I mean, they built enough weapons, nuclear weapons, to destroy life on Earth 20 times over. The, the system itself is insane. The people have, the owners of capital have to do, have, they have to show a higher profit the next quarter no matter what. And we have to take that power away from them. Uh, I'm glad that Justin read Imperialism and the Split in Socialism. It's sort of a short, much shorter version of, of Imperialism in the Highest Stage of Capitalism. And it's well worth reading. And he does deal primarily there with the question of the labor aristocracy that uh, Caleb raised. And this is a complicated question. It's a fluid, it's a fluid category. But basically, and Marx, of course, didn't even really live to see Imperialism in full bloom. Um, but uh, the way Lenin put it was that uh, the super profits of imperialism are so great, and these are Lenin's words, it allows them to bribe a section of the working class in the imperialist countries into acquiescence or support for imperialism. I want to be clear we're distinguishing between the labor bureaucracy and the labor aristocracy. The labor bureaucracy is the, is the leaders of the unions. The labor aristocracy are well-paid sectors of the working class. Uh, Lenin was using a shorthand. It, what actually was is that the uh, and the, the, the biggest manifestation of this was in, was in the US after World War II that the profits were so great it made it worth their while to uh, in the interest of class peace to um, try to avoid class struggle at home, to try to dampen it. And there were class struggles. They never voluntarily gave a raise to anyone. But, uh, uh, there, but there is the fact that the, the living standard of workers in the U.S. did rise tremendously after World War II, of some, not all, of many, in the context of imperialism as well as the class struggle. But this is a, a process that has uh, now gone into reverse because they're going, they're destroying uh, in their drive for profit, their mad drive for, just as irrationally as they're destroying the earth, they're destroying the very so base of social stability in the United States itself in their, in their, in their drive for profits. And uh, so this, this category of the working class is shrinking and now we have, you know, um, the, the vast majority of new jobs are, are, uh, are uh, low-wage jobs. It also brings the question that Marshall raised. There should be a lot more discussion about this. That Marshall raised about monopolies and the socialization of production because really what it, monopoly is is the, I mean, it, it, the hope for socialism relies on the, on the uh, modern technology. But now, while it was expanding once, while the labor force was expanding intensively, now technolo technology has gotten to the point where geometrically uh, they're eliminating uh, more workers than they're employing. Uh, the, uh, the it's the growth of the contradiction between uh, social ownership and, I'm sorry, social production and private ownership. And that's getting more, that's exacerbating uh, greatly. They talk about, you know, they like to have people, have the, the workers focus on jobs going to China or something. All, uh, technology has eliminated many more jobs than 
overseas uh, plants and um, even all over the world technology is eliminating jobs even in China we have to take those plants out of their hands we have to seize them we have to uh, reorganize society in the interest of the working class of the world working class that's the only uh, only answer and imperialism has created, has created the possibility of doing so um, not, um, monopoly capitalism has, capitalism has imperialism actually was a, was a break on development for most of the world but even now it could not be a to permanent break and now uh, there are more the working class, the largest working class in the world is in China um, the uh, question of slavery and capitalism, I'm glad Adam brought that up. And this is a whole, should be a whole other class. And uh, I'd recommend a book. There's a wonderful book by Eric Williams, who was once Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, called uh, Capitalism and Slavery, and also uh, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. But um, the slave, uh, imperialism began in the late 19th century. European Colonialism is much older than that, several hundred years. In fact, uh, the slave trade really began in the early 1400s, um, almost 100 years before the Protestant Reformation in Europe. And um, it was, um, you know, in the really European colonialism that gave rise to capitalism in Europe. It was. Uh, there are pre-capitalist developments going on all over the world. You know, in West Africa, in China, certainly in India. Um, but they were aborted by the fact that a European plunderer by the name of Christopher Columbus blundered, landed here on the way to India. And uh, the, um, because with the help of disease, the fact that uh, European countries were able to colonize North America and decimate the population here gave the bourgeoisie in Europe a real leg up. And uh, in relation, and, and even as late as the 1700s, it would not have occurred to anybody that Europe was the most advanced place in the world. And this is, by the, by the way, an important debate inside Marxism because there are, there is a European chauvinist school that holds that Capitalism developed in Europe on its own, out of its own, uh, some internal force peculiar to Europe, a European society. In fact, Europe was one of the least advanced places in the world. But what uh, the conquest of the Americas did, the slave trade and uh, the genocide of the native people and later the opium trade with China, it, it, well, that was more in the colonial phase, it gave, uh, it strengthened the European bourgeoisie in relation to the feudal class in Europe to the point where they were able to take power and clear the way for, uh, and, for uh, and create capitalist rule which didn't happen in other parts of the world and um, which led to the growth of mass industry and then when the European colonialists first went into India and, and uh, Africa they were going to sell commodities but then the growth of industry led to crisis and monopoly capitalism and imperialism. And yes, the North, the banks in New York, this city was a pro-Confederate city during the Civil War, and that was because of the, the, the ties of the banks to slavery. And this was when there was still a divergence between uh, banking capital and industrial capital, which had a, which even though, you know, some of the early colonial wars of this country, like the seizure of northern Mexico, now called Texas and Arizona, that was a slave owner's war. The northern bourgeoisie mostly was against it because it strengthened the power of slavery. Of course, when they defeated the slave owners and they didn't give it back. Uh, I think Comrade Stephanie is going to give a talk on Columbus and uh, on the, uh, on the uh, <laughs> genocide against native people, but it was critical to the rise of capitalism in Europe. And uh, yeah, the, uh, a contradiction arose between slavery became a bro break on the development of capitalism in the North. And here's a once more another example of the historical materialism because slavery was much less productive than northern capitalism, than industrial, than wage labor. But the scum slave owners in the South, they, had, they owned all these human beings as property and they weren't going to let them free. And it took a war, which is really a revolution, uh, to do it. Um, you know, uh, 
Lenin said on the question of, quote, religious fanaticism. You know, the U.S. will ally with religious forces. It did in Afghanistan against a pro-socialist government there in the 1980s. It's allying with them in Syria against a more secular government. It allied with them in Libya, and it's fighting them in Afghanistan. Actually, I think what they want in the Middle East, in the Arab world, is a sectarian war, to create a sectarian war between uh, Sunnah and Shia. This was a plan that uh, was openly espoused by some of their puppets in the region after uh, the Lebanese resistance, after Hezbollah was able to unite all the people of Lebanon, Muslim, Sunni, Shia, and Christian, uh, against uh, Israel and, and, and to give, hand Israel its first significant military defeat. But because rea imperialism is the most reactionary force in the world that means not just exploitation, but genocide and strangulation and destruction of the means of production, that's why we ally with anyone who is fighting imperialism, because the imperialist ruling class is also our number one enemy as workers here. And anything that weakens them strengthens us. And Lenin said, uh, we will support, Lenin actually said, we will support anyone in the world who is fighting imperialism even the emir of Afghanistan. And that's no less true today than it was then. Uh, some of us had the uh, pleasure of having dinner with President Ahmadinejad last week. And uh, the main theme of his talk was the need to abolish nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, but of course, it's really not about nukes at all or nuclear energy. The US was uh, trying to sell nuclear energy to Iran when the Shah was in power. It's about uh, the fact that Iran, has, that Iran has, this, has a huge oil industry and the profits from that oil industry do not go to ExxonMobil or, or uh, Chase Morgan Bank. They go into the, for the development inside Iran itself. Even if it's in the hands of the bourgeoisie, the United States imperialism cannot, intolerate, cannot tolerate even an independent bourgeoisie. Um, cannot tolerate even develop, development, even on a bourgeois basis uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, what else was there? Uh, you raised a question, I think it was about violence, wasn't it? Uh, my question was, uh, oh, and, and in relation to uh, your question about uh, banks and uh, slavery, should read a book called Life, Liberation, and Socialism? Did it mm -hmm. a lot of information on what you But my question was, is that um, what are your views on sustaining the mass struggle against imperialism and the role of violence in that struggle? Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, we support the right of anybody in the world who is fighting for liberation to use, fight for it by any means necessary. We defend that right. We're against violence. That's why we're trying to overthrow this violent system. But I'll give you a, uh, to answer that, I think I'll go not to Karl Marx or Lenin, but to the Quran, where it says, People have a different view of 